Um, that must have been a very difficult thing to do, to sit in the inquest and address um, Jacintha's family directly. Why did you want to do that? I made a promise to the um, Saldana family that I would answer any questions they had and the right forum for that was at the inquest. Uh, the opportunity came up to apologise face to face and I think that's the way you should do it, not through a letter, not through the media. I wanted to be able to say that face to face. And when I made eye contact with the family, they were looking directly at me and I could see that they wanted that apology. Mm. and. They accepted that apology, and, and that means a lot to both of us. What did you say? That I was sorry, and that I hope they've found the strength to move forward. Um, it must be so hard for them. They've lost their mother, their wife, and the children, and what they had to listen to through that inquest showed a huge amount of strength. You know, some very distressing details. And did you feel you had to do all of that for, for you to, to enable yourself to move on? I think a bit of both, absolutely. Um, I wasn't able to move forward. I had uh, deep depression. I'm sure, you know, it was very tough for the family as well, but there was, there was something that was holding me back and I felt I had to do whatever I could to help them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're very much the person that this now centres on. Of course, you were co-hosting this show with um, Michael Christian. We don't really seem to hear so much about them. Why is that? We went down different paths. I couldn't go back into that radio station. I didn't, at the time, want to continue a media career. Um, he chose he could. And as well, with depression, it affects certain people. And I was the only one, I believe, on the team that suffered that mental illness from the event. It can be triggered from a traumatic event, and for me, that's what happened. When did you find out um, that Jacintha had taken her life? It was Friday about midnight in Australia. I was in bed, and uh, my partner was looking through Twitter, and he saw the tweet saying, you've got blood on your hands, uh, you're a nurse killer, you, uh, you should be hung yourself. It was this horrendous tweets coming through and he didn't quite understand what was going on until my phone started ringing and work informed me what had happened. But uh, Looking back on it now, if someone had asked you to do that now, would you think twice? Because I've worked in Australia, I've worked in uh, live TV shows and live radio shows and I think it's a very brash environment, isn't it? It's very yeah. much more aggressive and in your face. Has things changed? Well, prank calls have been around for years. Mm. You know, it really was something that was a staple thing that a lot of radio stations would do because the idea is you get permission from the person that has been pranked and you know they're okay with it. If they say yes, yeah. they're comfortable with it. So this was a very different situation. Your radio station did have a bit of a history, though, with getting into trouble with these calls. Now, I mean, you, no one could have foreseen this tragic outcome. I don't yeah. think anyone's suggesting that you could have foreseen this tragic outcome. But did, did you have a niggle at the back of your head that at some point these kind of pranks might go horribly wrong in some way? Or did you just not consider that? No, you don't consider it because there's a process in place that's meant to protect everyone involved. There shouldn't be an issue because it should all be a part of the process. So it goes through the stages and the outcome should be fine with the person being pranked and with the people involved. Mm -hmm. That was the headspace you were in then. What's the headspace you're in now, moving forward? Because you said you want to continue with the media career. Yes. Potential in the UK? Well, someone asked me that question yesterday, and I hadn't considered it before because, um, and no offence to Londoners, but I expected this to be a horrible place, people with pitchforks at the airports waiting to, to get me. I had this vision that the UK hated me because for months all I would do is read online that you deserve to die, we hate you, don't come here, and I believed it all. And after arriving, I saw how beautiful it is here, and that was the first time when someone asked me, I'm like... Well, if the opportunity came up, mm. why wouldn't I mm. consider but don't it? You, but, but cynics could say, yes, well, you've come here and you are very articulate and uh, you're good at expressing yourself. You know, somebody could say, yeah, but hang on, are you not you know, over here looking for another job because maybe it is easier to work here than in Australia? No, not at all. And why would it be easier? Like, this is where it, it yeah, happens, you, know, you know. Mm. No, absolutely not. No. So moving but forward, Mel, where, where's your, where is your head now? You know, uh, you must have reassessed so many things. What's yes. changed for you fundamentally? Things must have fundamentally changed the way you Absolutely. see the world. Absolutely. Well, now we need to think, what can we learn from this tragic event? 
and that is what I'm doing and that is why I'm in the UK and it was always to speak at that radio festival yesterday directly to radio announcers and producers. It's not about sitting here in the media and saying, you know, poor me, I'm a victim, now I want work, someone employ me. Mm -hmm. It's sharing this experience so people know with depression you can get through it, you just need to fight through it. And in radio, we need to look out for each other. And people that are victims of prank calls, we need to think. And that's why if I do get back on air, I'm going to be a lot wiser. And it's such a powerful medium to get those messages across. Okay.